Hemshech Chaim Beis, Volume One. We begin Discourse Fifteen, Page Kuv One Hundred Four, Chapter Nun Zayin Fifty Seven. The overall theme is the distinction between transcendent energy, otherwise known as the root of Er HaSevev, Makif, whose uh, function is nothing but to reveal its source and to express its source, Gili Mina Etzem, and imminent energy, otherwise known as the root of Mamali, of Pnimi, the ten hidden spheres before the symptom, which is purpose and function is to to radiate within and be internalized in existence. So both are er, meaning they both are emitting divine energy, but with very different roles. And in explaining this, we began first with a discussion. Obviously, the first 46 chapters of I Am Bez was primarily, but it was all about imminent energy. Eris and Kalim, energies and containers, their roots in the ten hidden spheres, the Kav, the symptoms impact on all of that. And page, in chapter 46, he began to say, and that all is the internal energy, imminent energy. And then, from there he started to go into now the comparison to the transcendent energy, which is Keser, which is where the whole point of discussion began, the beginning of the discourse, chapter 1. And he began to compare the two and define their, their, their distinctions. And the primary example that he began with was the difference between Rotson and Kreches. So Rotson, which is Keser. And Kreches, which are the faculties. And that's the example that he used only in the beginning of the Hemshech in chapter 2, 3, 4. Yeah. Is that Rotson is similar as Gili Mina Etzem. It has no substance of its own. All it is is a reflection, expression of the soul, its desires. And the faculties is how it gets done. The instruments. And there the function is to implement something. L'hoyer is to have a relationship with something else outside of itself, and to manifest there in a form of islapsus, which means internalized and integrated. And then, to go there, the last discourse, 14, he said, another example of faculty, desire and faculties, let's take it back now, Lamaila. What's Lamaila? Eir Ein Sof. Eir is Ein Sof, that the energy, the divine em- emission, I've been using the word transmission, and I want to correct myself. Emission and transmission is transmission means something transmits, absorbs an energy coming from a source, absorbs it and transmits it further. An emitter, emission, is the thing itself is giving off its own energy. So in truth is, when you say divine emission, you're really saying God is not a divine transmitter. You could say energy is a transmitter of the divine's uh, plan and so on. But emission maybe would be better, divine emission rather than transmission. But just the technicality. So, in beginning chapter in, in discourse fourteen, meaning chapter fifty, um, fifty uh, uh, three, until where we are now, he began to er sof that the energy itself is ein sof, not just that its source is ein sof for the reasons he explained. And to explain that, what does it mean that the energy itself is ein sof? He's talking obviously primarily the transcendent energy, is because the difference in er and shefa. So Eren Shefa is now another way to explain the transcendent and the imminent. So Er is, uh, we'll start with Shefa, he starts with Shefa. Shefa is a, something of substance is being transmitted. It impacts the source and it requires an involvement, a commitment, work, effort, exertion. The classic example is a teacher and a student. He gave other examples. Er, on the other hand, doesn't have any of the three that I just mentioned. It's no substance. The energy has no substance of its own, I mean it has particles, but it means there's no entity being transmitted that will remain with the recipient, or emitted, and be remain with the recipient. Two, it doesn't have an impact on the source, and three, it doesn't require efforts. 
And the cl- three examples he gave for it, primarily two examples, is sunlight, which all three are there. The sun does not, the energy is just the light of the sun is just light. Nothing, no mochus dover, it's not a personality, it doesn't have a whole identity. Um, take away the source, the light is gone. Two, the, um, the doesn't have any impact on the sun, whether it shines or it doesn't shine, whether, it's, whether there are clouds or not. And three, the sun doesn't have to immerse itself and involve itself and work at emitting light. The second example is the soul. Same thing with the soul. The soul does not, uh, the soul, the energy of the soul is only energy of the soul. Okay, there he doesn't really talk about the substance of it, but it's the same idea, just a reflection of the soul. Take away the soul, there's nothing there, it remains. The soul does not affect, is not affected by the energy that it gives off. And three, it doesn't have to work, it comes off automatically. And the third example, which is, I mean, I guess a sub-example was a flame that heats objects, that heats metal. And there too, the metal is being heated automatically by the flame. The flame does not have to exert itself. And, uh, and the flame is not impacted by what it's heating. And obviously the, the, third, the first aspect, maybe not there exactly, but the same idea. Then he qualifies this in the last chapter. This was all chapter 50. What I just said now is chapter 55. Chapter 56, the last chapter we learned, he qualifies it. That both the, the two, two examples of the sun and the soul, each one have, qual, uh, have, have a, an element that the other one doesn't have that explains the example better, according, relating to God. The soul's so-called weakness in the example is that the soul is bound by the body, is bound by the body, can be giving life to another body. In that aspect, it's somewhat like the teacher is immersed and, get, and applying himself to the student. He can't be doing something else. So though there's no effort on the soul's part, and though there's uh, the soul itself is not impacted, but it is tough, snitfus in this body. Whereas the sun is not, the sun remains apart from. So in this aspect, the sunlight, sun is more, is more compatible with the divine because the divine is not bound by the place that it shines or radiates it. On the other hand, On the other hand, there was one more thing I should have mentioned with light, that light also reflects its essence, me'ein ha'etzem, like he says, it's k'moy ha'etzem, it's similar to the etzem, whereas shafa is only the fi'ifin ha'etzem. That's also a critical point, because that too is in the divine light, the transcendent light is reflecting the essence of Zain Sof, so the two is Zain Sof. Whereas shafa is already more involved with where, it's, where the recipient goes, so it's still air in the sense that it's still coming from, it's still emitting from the divine source, but it's, no, it's only um, informed by the source as opposed to being a reflection of the source's personality, so to speak. Anyway, going back to the soul, so that's the downside side of the soul. The upside of the, the, upside of the soul, the downside of the sun is that it has to shine. The sun is created to shine. It has no choice. Mukhrach. The soul, on the other hand, is a Gilead Ritzani. It's, it's by will. And he brought two proofs. One is that you see the soul can conceal its faculties completely, like Avraham Avinu, who concealed it by the Akedah. And the, the second example was Gilgulim, was reincarnation, where the soul completely is concealed from the fact that it may be uh, inside of a, an animal. And he discussed the details of that, back and forth, back and forth, which we discussed. Which, which bottom line, comes down to this, that the soul has a quality that the sun doesn't have in the example, and the sun has a quality that the sun, the soul, the soul doesn't have. So the Gilu Ritzani, that is by desire, obviously is more fitting to the divine, because the divine doesn't have to shine. And then, he, follow, he concludes that with saying, these are the two forms of energy, transcendent energy and imminent energy. So he does tie it up. So the discussion that began, chapter, 50, in chapter, in chapter 46, is in a way coming to a close here even though he's going to continue, but he definitely ties it up, that this is transcendent energy and imminent energy. 
And it's all part of the extension of the discussion of this in this discourse 14. And I said that began chapter 53 about what is Er and Shefa. And of course he applied it beautifully to Sheftim Vesheitim, which I'm not going to review now. That was yesterday's class. And in the context of the interface, obviously, these are two critical elements in the interface. Transcendent energy is so-called representing the source in its purest form. Imminent energy is also representing the source. It's also doing with the source once, but it's now doing with the source once, and it's the instruments to speak to existence. So these two are critical. And we see at the end of the discourses, when he explains the verses, he keeps emphasizing, I notice this almost in every end, that Makif and Primi have to come together. In the actual discourse itself, before he comes to answer the questions at the end, doesn't emphasize that yet. But clearly, that's the ultimate goal, where they, they both are, they both work with each other, and both contribute to each other. In Shaftim Vishetrim, he said that. In the Maimur Anachimu, he said that. And then, and the Maimur in Tzim Bamishpat Tepad, and the Maimur Ati Yisrael. So all of them, that's where he brings these two elements together. And it's really the, like a central theme that really explains so many verses. That's what you also see here, that almost every Pasuk in Torah, every concept in Torah, is explained by these two ideas, makif and primi, transcendent energy and imminent energy, and how they work closely together. So now we begin discourse number 15, that the Friedrich Rebbe's summary on the discourse number 15 is what? As I said, the summary of the Teichen as Cholos So Sheftim was Eir Ein Sof, Eir Veshefa. The last Maimer was Eir Ein Sof, the Eir, light, and Shefa flow. And Kiseitze, he says, Eir makif, Eir Pnimi. Which obviously is within the theme of our discussion. So we're on chap- page 104. And we begin, When you will go out to war upon your enemies, your adversaries, your foes, and God will give them to you in your, in your hands. It means you will conquer them, vanquish them. We have to understand what is the meaning of the words kiseitse. You will go out. Lucher avalemem kiseilach. Kiseitse means to go out. You'd see it to go out. Kiseilach when you will go. Seilach is the word to go to wage war. Kiseilach l'molchama. What seitse? V'gam ashikosiv v'nos nasham l'kach biyadecha. And also that which it says that God will give you that will give them to you in your hands. Literally, which means that you will win over them. It seemingly contradicts what it says right before that, that you will go out to war. The mashmash is The apparent meaning of that is when you will go out, when you will wage war, meaning it's in your power. It's your initiative, it's your effort. And the words right after it says, and God will give them to you. Is what... Is, a, is what God gives from above. So in other words, is this a miraculous type of war, or is it a natural type of war? You go out to wage war, and God will um, will give them to you. Obviously, you could answer that you go out, you do your efforts, and God blesses you, but clearly, there's two different things going on here. One is you'll wage war, and the second, that apparently is your effort and the Shnash al is Lanasina that is be given from above. Vihine be Medrashra but now in Medrashra be Isa Posuk Tse Hilochem Ba Molek and the Posuk that says Tse also Tse to go out and wage war with Amolek the arch enemy of the Jewish people who attacked them when they came out of Egypt. Mekan, the Medr says, from here we learn, Shayyir Nesunim, Taches Anani HaKovet. From here we learn that they were, the Jews were Nesunim. They were, uh, at that point they were placed. They were surrounded beneath, the, they were placed and they were, um, okay. they're located below, beneath the clouds of glory. The ain aimrim say el lemisha shari b'fnim because you don't say say go out only to someone that is dwelling within. So you say go out, go out of where? That means you're somewhere and you go out. Vim came kamoy kain kan shenemek yisaytzei 
So if that's the case, based on that medrash, it says say say here. There's a, a rule that it, the medrash says. You don't say say unless someone is dwelling within. So also this can be applied also here. Shenemek you say say it says go out. How does it come? Gam can come. B'misha shari b'fnim. It's also it's about someone who is dwelling within. Umashmoy saying the b'fnim ain't a shaykh mukhama. And from the apparent meaning of the medrash, and from this context, is that within. Where you're dwelling within is not possible war. Only when you go out, that's where it's possible. That's why it says, because while you're dwelling within, there's no Muhammad. That's why you go out, and that's where you say to Muhammad or say he lochim ba'amolek, or with Amolek. And seemingly not understood, why do you need to, why do you need to go out from within in order to wage war? The Gam Mashma, it also appears, that the power to wage war is because you dwelled within. And through leaving within, from where then, you have the power to wage war outside of you. Why is it Mashma? Because why, you know, what's the point? What's the emphasis here? Why do we have to tell you leave? Because it means there's something that you have, some power you have within, and you carry that with you, that gives you the power to fight outside of you. To understand all this, we have to preface that which was discussed earlier, that the infinite transcendent light is it reveals, expresses the essence, the source. And that's why it's called Ensef. Ha'atzmis. That's why it's called Ensev, because it's Pashat. It is it's seamless, formless, in the level, in the state of Pshitus Ha'atzmis. A fundamental simplicity. Fundamental formlessness. Interesting thing, I'm looking back in the previous discourse, and though he says in the beginning, he says Ensev refers to the energy itself, That is that it is is pashtus. It's a gilia etzem. But here, really, you can see the emphasis of why he brought that. In other words, in the last discourse, he did. He he. he um, let me just see something. No, I'm sorry. He did say it specifically. No, he did say it at the end of the last chapter. So in the last, the last chapter, basically, what he's emphasizing now, that air ain't soft because it's air ain't soft because the air is gilly the etzem. And then he continues here. And therefore, to explain, and to explain this, he says, when his boy the and we and it was explained the difference between air and shefa. Air v'shefa. The expression air, which means light or energy, v'shefa, which means flow. Both are emissions. But different types. The shefa who shem who's dover nishpa v'nimshach. In shefa, the who's dover, something of substance, something substantial, who's essential, is emitted. V'nimshach is emitted and transmitted. Maybe that's the difference between nishpa and nishpach. V'klolasin hashpo ibchdei lifel, and the general the general the emission or transmission is in order to affect. It has a function to, to do something, to achieve something. And that's why it's in a form of twist and slapsus, meaning that there's that it's something is being manifest here and internalized. The transmitter or the emitter is contained by it, is committed to it, is involved in it. Since something of substance, something is really being transmitted here or emitted, he is he is committed to it. He's grasped by it. Nitvus means he's contained by it. He's confined by it, invested in it. There's many ways to translate that. And also because the purpose of it is to affect and achieve something. So also the activity, the pula, not just the one, the emitter, 
But the action that he is initiating is also in the form of Tvis Tvis Lapshas. So in other words, you could, you could say the source, okay, the source wants to now achieve ten spheres. He wants a structure of existence. So yes, there's a tvisius lapsus. He wants ten, not eleven, and so on. But you could say the energy itself, however, maybe is uh, remains shapeless. He says no. The, the action itself of creating, the action itself is also in a form of manifestation. If you remember the examples he gave, let's say when, we, when you create art or when you throw something, so throwing is just an external, you throw an object, stone. But when you draw something, not only is the artist involved, the act of drawing itself is, reveals more and is itself an a internalized type of um, action, activity. And then he has in the parentheses, and also from the perspective of the recipient, it's like almost the third thing. There also has to be a preparation to grasp and to contain the emission. By contrast, rather by contrast, light energy is only a reflection. Not mohuz dover. Valkane and therefore doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't emit in a form of tvisin slapshus where it manifests and and uh, and um, is, is contained and manifest. But the virtue of air, yes, the virtue of shefa is that it's internalized. The virtue, quality of energy and light, is that a gilim in etzem. That it's a it's a revelation from the essence itself. That's similar to the source. And that's why the light and energy is also in a form of pshitus, of seamlessness. Of um, substanceless, of shapelessness. Finis Boyd and explains that these two things, Shef and Er, the first, the former, is the energy to radiate within the world, the imminent energy, and the latter is the energy light that is to reveal the essence, that has no end and no. Limits. Clearly, in sof, bli gvul can be synonymous, but sof means end, gvul means limit, parameter. And he said, the only thing we can call it is rotsen, desire, he said that at the end of last chapter. So now we continue within the discourse, chapter 57. However, we still need to understand the haloi ba mesholim de er, v'ziv Hashem is ve'er v'chais ha'nefesh, isn't it true? Isn't it the Allah, Isn't it a fact that in the example? Allah, isn't it so that the examples, these two examples we've been using, the light and reflection of the sun, the light and the energy of the soul, they they also have a function. They're not just revealing something. They have both. They have a function. They They're there to achieve something. They're not just revelation of the essence. Yes, they have the elements that we spoke that they don't have to. It's not. A, it's not manifest. It's not uh, affecting them. It's not manifesting with effort, tirde and isaskis and all of that. It's not a mohuz dover. But to say that this is the example for the higher energy, the transcendent journey, which is just revealing the essence. And has no other function. How could you say that? Both these examples have a function. They live for they're there to achieve something. Shayan is boilil, pedik memches. Like we learned earlier, chapter 48. Let's see, 48. 48 was correct. That's when he said the sun is an example for Erdham Amale. Because its function, the whole purpose of the sun is to radiate the earth, as in chapter 48, page 84. 
That's where he said, the energy that comes the first day that pierces through everything and you can see from one end of the world to the other, that's an example of the higher energy. That the light, sunlight is, is not just to um, to describe, to give us an image, to, to give us a, a picture, a snapshot. Of the essence of the source, came lifel but poolus Like it says, God created the celestial bodies; He put them in the heavens, to radiate this earth. So it's not just a revelation of the essence. That's with the sun. And the second example as well, the chain er nefesh. And the second example, the same thing with the energy, with the light. And, and, and energy of the soul. So it's interesting. By Shemesh he says Ziv Erev Ziv. And by, uh, by Nefesh he says Erev Chayes. Because in the soul you have the element of also giving life. So it has an additional, additional uh, virtue that also helps us understand. Because the divine energy that emits from the source gives life. The sun also helps life. But you can't say it's a life giver. So here we also have Chayes So the same thing with Erev Chayes Nefesh. Adinyonu lifel pu'ula lichis. The pu'ulas. Adinyonu lifel pu'ula sa Chayes. Its inyan, meaning its purpose, its, its, its role, is to affect an activity, to bring life, to, to bring life into something. So that's the question. The example seemingly weakens this element that there's no that there's no function except to reveal the, the source. And now he's saying even more. The truth is also with Er Makif, even the Nimshal. This is the Moshal. The same thing above. Isn't it known that even the Er Makif, and also the Er Makif, affects Actions in these worlds, in the worlds. So it's not just revealing the essence, even the makif also has an effect on the world. Vim Cain, and if that's the case, we need explanation. What then is the fundamental difference between the transcendent energy and the immanent energy? Before we said the difference is one is just like the color of an object, all it's doing is reflecting the source. The other one is specifically would not exist if you did not have worlds and would not have a purpose for them to emanate, to radiate, and to be internalized in existence. But as you just established, both in the example and in also Er Makif, you can't just say they have no pool of it, that they have no in your lifel. They absolutely do have a function. So what's the difference between the two? Obviously, this is building up a case. You know, clearly what he said earlier is all true. But he's not going into more detail and breaking it down. Acha Inyan, who, however, the Inyan in this is, the answer to this is, the thing that we derive, what is understood from both examples. The examples above, the above mentioned examples, the kosher hu the kosher hu everything that is in this, in, in a, in a um, state of light or energy, even the, that which it does affect, when it does affect something, it's not the way Shefa affects. So he's now, of course, explaining this much deeper. In other words, not to be simplified and just say, er, has no effect. It's explaining that what's understood from all the examples and everything we discussed is that the effect is different. The pu'ula b'shem b'chinah shefa, the effect, the impact that's on this, the, in the state of shefa, something that is called a shefa flow, who b'chinah tfisav islapshus, is in a form that it is, I keep looking for the word because I can't find the exact word for tfisa. It is, 
um, it manifests within it. While you're there, you're there. Like you said, the energy goes into the stone. It's not just an oblivious aloof. I mean, I, I could translate more the opposite of Tfisa than Tfisa. Not Tfisa is like, it's like two people having a conversation, and one of them says, I'm in this conversation, you're not in it. You know, you're just, you're just doing this uh, by, mechanically or just to uh, be Yetzir, just to satisfy me. You ever hear, you have such conversations where one person, you don't feel there's a twist and stop. So they're not committed to the conversation. They're not involved. So those, that would be the words. But the word involved itself is more than just involved, meaning there's a certain applying yourself to it. Tfisa is applying yourself. You're grasped within it. That's uh, the way, I, and slapshus is obviously a little more than that. It's like a slapshus, you're manifested, you're now dressed in this garment. And you're not in another garment. Shefa works that way. Mashen kem however the function, the impact of light energy, is not in this type of involved, committed, applied way. He's going back to the example. Like in the light and reflection of the sun. And the same is also with the light and energy of the, of the soul, of the spirit. Like discussed earlier, chapter 55. So the sun, we see it very clearly. There's no difference where the sun shines. And same with the light and energy of the soul. There's no difference between a coarse body or an edel, a refined and uh, subtle body. This he said all this earlier. That just like in the same body, in the one body, there's no difference of how life, the life force we're talking, goes into the more the coarser organs or into the subtler organs, more refined organs. The same is there's no difference. A soul, the life that it gives to a coarse body or to a uh, refined body, dak, refined, edel, subtle. I mean, let's define what this means. I don't think he's referring to necessarily a grub Jung. Meaning, excuse me, somebody that is not refined spiritually. Guv gas means a heavy person, and guv dak means a, a, a frail person or a, 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 a thin person. He's speaking very physically here. Rosh Kip Shute. Yeah. No, because you could say with Edelkeit in Ruchni is so. Not, then there's cloud, that, but, but he's talking about the life force. He's not talking here about the, the, the spirituality of the soul. Yeah. Or chai is skufnis. Nefesh. The biological life. So to say somebody, yeah, obviously someone that's overweight or big, it could be the other reasons that maybe they they're, they're, they're place danger. But the soul giving it life, it's not like he's less alive. Or let's say this is the soul working overtime because it has to now give life to a 300 pound person as opposed to a 100 pound person. That's the point here. Like the sun. The sun is very clear. The sun shines. It makes no difference if it's shining on the most beautiful palace, the Holy of Holies, or a garbage pile, the Havna. That's why within the body itself, he said, there's no difference between the head, giving the, the soul's life force inside the brain, inside the head, and in the, he says, Ekev Shabbat which is the most gas. Ekev is sometimes called Malach HaMove Shabbat It's called the, 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 the angel of death within the human being because the, the Ekev, the heel, is the most, um, has the least amount of, uh, huh? Sensitivity. Yeah, sensitivity, because it has to have the buffer to be able to walk on the ground. But to, to say a life force, God forbid, something happens even in the farthest point, extremity of the heel, it's as, li- as live as any other part of the body. There's no difference. You cannot distinguish in the life force that one part of the body is more alive than another. In the life force. I'm not talking about expression of the life force. So we see from this that the impact, the effect, the activity of air is not in the form of 
Islapshus vitvisi, he changes the order now, instead of tvisi and islapshus. It's not in a form of manifestation, dressing up, committed, applied, all the words I used before, contained. Because if it would be, then it would not be equal in the two places. Think of a teacher trans- emitting ideas. Yes, a student that has a thicker head and the one that has a more refined mind, there's going to be a very big difference in how the f- flow will, will, how the mission will take place. And the teacher will have to apply himself and say, this one I give like this, this one I give. Here the soul doesn't have that aspect. So it's important to contrast here. Just to talk, in other words, abstractly about sunlight and about the, the power, the energy, life force of the soul is not going to help us much. You want to talk about it in contrast. In contrast to Shefa, Eir is a completely different type of pool, not Trisvi Slapshus. Still didn't answer the question that means that they said it's not, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have any function because we've established now that it has something. He's going to get back to that. But he's just saying the key thing from the examples that we know now is that they're not the same. Because now, now the primary difference between Eir and Shefa, between the light and energy, and Shefa and the flow that we just described. Meaning, between imminent energy and transcendent energy. And I'm specifically using those words because we established that Makiv does not mean outside like he says in Tanya. It means it's there, but it's concealed. It's not within, measured by the containers, but it's also in there, in, within all of existence. And Erpnimi is nirgish, is sensed by the containers, and is, is imminent, internalized, inter, and integrated. The Erpnimi, what is the primary difference between them? The Erpnimi, I'm shakhose, mina atmosu b'chines mochus metziyiz dover. The Erpnimi, its emission, or transmission, from the source, from the essence, from atmos is in a form of, in a state, in a state of mohus mitziyiz dover, of sub, of identity and substance. Let's explain what that means. Not identity and substance that you can touch it with your fingers. It's ten spheres. Even in ten hidden spheres. Ten and not eleven. Ten and not infinite. The air makif and the transcendent energy, hamshachose, it's Emission or transmission, is ayin. It is fundamentally a different type of emission. It's ayin. It's substanceless. It has no shape and form. And you can't call it as a sphere. There's no ten. It's either unlimited or altogether no spheres. Just to use that as an example. So right there you have two types of emission going on. One has definition and one doesn't, basically. One is ain't sof. As he put it, and one has has some type of definition. It may not be limited energy, but the energy itself, like he said, the infinite energy, Shiratsme, he measured within himself. What did we say yesterday? The word Shiratsme. He, you said a word, he um, defines. Assess. Huh? Assess. Assess. You said evaluate. Evaluate. He evaluates. There's then something going on. There's an evaluation going on. A mishpat, as he put it in the end of the last member. The hainu, the tchilas eifan hamshach of isgal shalah mina atzmus. Which means, from the root, from the beginning, not later. The tchilas eifan hamshach of isgal shalah mina atzmus. That the beginning, the tchilas, the point of departure. The tchilas, the beginning of the way they were transmitted, emitted, and revealed from the... the their revelation from the essence. The, 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 the imminent energy, internal energy, nimtza says nimtza min atmos because atmos is not up. Effort is extend is uh, emerges from the essence is a mitzias dover as something, some that something of definition. And the ermakiv emerges from the essence in a form of ayin. So you have two different types of emissions. Now let me just qualify before anyone asks any questions. Obviously you start comparing Eir Primi to Kalim and definitely to lower levels it's also pretty fine iron. But if you go all the way to the but if you subtly in its root these are two different types of emissions. Very, very different types. 
just wanted to qualify that. Because remember, it's also air. He didn't call this kalim yet. That's why I said we don't want to get stuck in words because you start saying, one second, this sounds very awfully like kalim. So what's kalim anyway? And kalim of Atzillas don't have any physical substance. They don't have any spiritual substance. So what's the difference between kalim and air? So I'm not going to go into it at length now because it's not the point here. But obviously a keli is a whole different uh, role. Keli is a recipient. A keli is a receptacle that's completely concealed. Like you spoke earlier, the Shimu. It's completely concealed. This air is not a concealment. This air is a definition of the artist's flow, but it's not a concealment. Is it all of Atmos? No, but also the air makif isn't all of Atmos, for that matter. But that's the distinction. We're talking about air. But within air, within the emission, the difference is an emission that is in the form of ayin, so, no definition, substanceless, and an emission that is in the form of definition. That's why I'm using the word definition, even though he used metzias dover, he doesn't mean metzias dover as in physical substance. It's always possible that the other one is not possible. Well, on its own, on, on, on its own, yeah, yeah, yeah. The other one's role is not to have gili. The other one's role is to receive and actually to reveal an essence of the divine that's beyond revelation, the essence itself. Kali has has the virtues that no air can no air can have. It, the air carries. Remember, the air always carries all energy, even the energy of containers. But it's not a container. So really, it's really like almost three levels in any situation. You have an entity, you have the container. You know, let's put it this way. We, he gave examples for it. Here's a good example. If you want to go. Letters on the page is containers. A, B, C, D, E. You combine them the right way, and they give off a message. You have air. That's air hagvul. A message. Then there's a deeper message. Like he said, air ha'il al-kolona, which is the sum total that's beyond the sum of the words. Things that are more subtle, between the lines. You know, then he said that even there you have something that has air hablikvul. All the way to the point of the wisdom that goes into combined words. In the Sefer Torah, the aura is the white between the. There's a different levels. All it's all there in Sefer Torah. You have the primi of the armakiv and the the eretz atzmi. The point is that just there's these levels. But let's continue. Let's go back here. I don't want to get distracted. I just wanted to make that qualification. V'zel gamki meshazeh ba lifel v'zeh ene ba lifel, and this is also the meaning that this comes to effect. To have a function and an, an impact, a role, a vize enabolifil. And this one does not enab does not come to effect. That's the meaning. The air premium pressure close in Yanu Lifel will hire us elements. The imminent energy, because of its general purpose, its general role, identity, is to affect and to radiate in the world into the world. Al Kain Tchilis Mitsuyuse, that's why the root of its beginning. The way it's the chilus mitzvah say it's initial emergence who shenim tzav b'chilus mitzvah davar is that it should emerge as a type of mitzvah as a type of identity because its purpose is to to uh, to uh, to radiate and affect the world. The chol pu'ula shayech kishu b'mitzvah davar dafke because every effect every impact is only possible when there's something of mitzvah. You can't have an impact if there's nothing going on. So the fact, when you say now the fact that it's, <clears throat> it comes to impact, <coughs> is what is what compels it to be a mitzvah's dover. And the transcendent energy emerges in the form of ayin, <coughs> nothingness, substanceless, identityless. There's a word like that. The fish ain't in yonili fell because it's not its job. Its function is not to. Its its identity is not to affect kimu pchinas gilim and etzim. It's only to reveal the essence. Okay. So, what did he add here that we didn't know before? He added here like this now. <coughs> he didn't yet follow up and you know conclude. What could you say that the Ermakiv doesn't have any impact? But he's explaining what does it mean? So he's saying um, right now he's saying I mean I want to read further and see how he continues this. (coughs) 
He hasn't answered the question yet. He's just adding what he added here is that all the way in the root, the, the Ur Shefa explains to us the difference between Primi and Makif. That in Ur, there is no, um, I'm sorry, in Shefa, there's something of substance. An identity, and in Ur, and in Ur there isn't. And therefore, the way what we describe it is one is comes to effect because it has an identity. It has a that's its function. The other one is substanceless and is iron because it doesn't have an impact. We'll soon get back to what the full meaning of that is. That's what he said right now. And in order to have impact, you have to have some type of identity. I assume what he means by that would be the following. To use the example the examples I've given before. Obviously the sun has impact. It, it heats and illuminates the world. So I don't want to use that example. Let's use the example of a teacher. A teacher is just sitting at his table and there's a glow in his face of, because of his wisdom. So incidentally people can be impacted by that. They can be influenced by it. But that's incidental. He, he is just what he's being who he is and the glow in his face is just revealing his wisdom period but if he wants to impact his student he has to involve himself he has to sit down and teach him apply himself impact requires not just the word effort it requires an action it requires some type of ident- um, quantifiable and definable act you want to throw a stone you have to physically grab the stone and throw it. You can't just think about it. You can't just imagine it. So, when the soul is giving life, or the sun is shining, I'm not getting now into whether they also have a purpose why they shine, but the way they function is not just effortless, but also substanceless. They're not giving off anything. They're not looking. They don't have to get involved in, and they're not um, emitting a, a particular identity. They are what they are, and they shine. And it has impact, fine. We'll discuss that later. But the way they fu- function is like air. In that sense. That's what air means. Shefa means that you are emitting something of substance that will remain and, and with the student and, and will, there be, it will remain forever outside of you. Or if not forever, per, per, temporarily. So there's something there. In order to be poil something, that's that's. So Eir Shefa comes to explain that so far. That's so far what he said. That's Eir Shefa. Okay. That's right. The Chopul Shaykes should be Mitzias Dover Dafke. So to say the effect that a student has by looking at the teacher's face, that's incidental effect. I'm not saying there's no effect. But when he says here Lifel. Shabal lifel, inyan who lifel, it means its inyan is to impact something. Impact requires you do something about it. You you emit something. Something has to be additionally emitted, not just your natural presence. That's what impact means in the, in this context. And the er makiv because it doesn't have this thing that has to impact. And have a, um, what do I say, impact. Um, Lifil. As to achieve something, what did I say before, Lifil? Impact. Uh, Lifil. Accomplish. To accomplish or to achieve. Change something. Function. That type of function, to function is something, and so on. So that's why. Lifisha ain't in your living, the king of Kinnis Gilliman. Uh, just revealing the essence. So he didn't yet answer the question, isn't that itself a purpose? What he did instead was say that there is no matter how you twist it, even even if they both they do both achieve something, but the way they achieve it is very different. That's the bottom line. And one can be called that doesn't come to achieve something because all it is is revealing, in that sense that there's nothing that has to be um, that has to be emitted, as he said here. 
V'zehu ha'muvu me'an moshul de'er v'shefa. This is what is understood from the example of er and shefa. The shefa hu bedavar shu b'chinis mohusu metzius. Shefa, the flow that's being emitted, is a thing that has mohus identity and metzius and substance. V'alkein ha'amshacha v'agili mi'itei e'nu rag b'chinis e'er. And that's why the transmission or the emission and the revelation from it. You could say maybe the transmission and the emission from it. Its emanation. It's not just in a form of, in a state of light or energy. Rather, something of something of substance. Something is something is being, is being, is being, is being emitted. Is being emitted. Now he's adding, the only thing is, it's only an external part of the source, of the emitter. You're not giving all of yourself. You're giving an outer part of yourself. It's also called a reflection. If you recall, he said earlier, where did he say this earlier? He says, Ha'ara. I'm trying to remember where he says it. Okay, whatever. He said something earlier. So why do we call this Ha'ara? If it's Shefa, how do you suddenly using the word Ha'ara reflection? Because comp- <laughs> because the fact is when a teacher is giving an idea, even though, as we just established, this is not like light, or it's a Shefa form of, of a transmission, but it's a, it's Chetzenius, because the outer part is Zakhar is only a Ha'ar is only a reflection from what's going on really inside. Because the inner dimension is atmis, is essential, is a fundamental element of you, of the entity, of the source. And the, and the outer is not that central and, and, and fundamental part of him. Nevertheless, it's coming from the muhus of the primis. In other words, it's not just like sunlight, which has no uh, substance at all. Here it's coming muhusa primis, like you said before, that it's informed by. It's coming from muhusa primis. So if it's seichel, for example, coming from a teacher, it's seichel. He's giving intelligence. You can't say this intelligence is, is just a reflection, just a mere reflection of himself. Like this, let's say the glow on his face. He's, com- he's communicating an idea. So it's mohus aprimis. But it's relatively only a reflection, meaning only an external part of what he really has in his mind. When you throw a stone, does, that, does the, the power of that throw have all your power within your arm? No. You may have only used only a part of it. A lot more power. But to say nothing was emitted, absolutely. The stone is flying, even if it's for an inch or two inches or a foot or two. Whereas sunlight or the energy of the, of the, of the soul is just a flow and there's absolutely no power being uh, invested in it, so to speak. The sun just has the power. It, it just gives off light. And I'm not saying the light has no power in it. And its impact can be even more than throwing a stone. We're not talking about the result. We're talking about from the perspective of the emitter. What, from the perspective of the emitter, there's not, he's not giving off part of himself. That's why... As he said, when you're throwing a stone, you can't do something else. The sun can be giving off light to many di- in, in, in all directions at once. Same thing with the soul. It can give life to every part of the body and to a thick body or a, a, a thin body. But nevertheless, it's muhus aprimi. Seichel, however, is coming from muhus. So it's an external. He's really, what we're doing really here, I'll tell you the truth, part of this is language. Because it all comes down to really language. The ideas are clear. What can get confused is language. You start saying, is the word er, ha'ara, reflection, light, energy. I mean, remember, he began by saying that the Mukabalim used the word er, where the philosophers used the word shefa. They're both describing the same thing, an emission. They weren't talking about two different, it's not apples and oranges, because then there's no discussion. Then er and shefa, one is, you're talking about this type of emission. That, uh, so why did the Mukabalim, why did the Kabbalists use the word er and the philosopher shefa for the same idea? Because each is emphasizing a different aspect of this emission. The philosophers focused much more on the emission as a function. God created something. So there's an emission that has definition, that has purpose, and so on. 
The Kabbalists went deeper and tried to understand the subtlety of how an emission flows from the divine. At the end of the day, both Er Pnimi and Er Makiv are two emissions. One functions more like Shefa, so they're both an emission. So a big part of this is really getting beyond the language and understanding. So we use the word Ha'ara by Shefa. Don't get confused that suddenly he's defining it. Obviously, Shefa is also a, a form of... And everything you can define as energy. What, what is an energy? Every emission is energy. If I'm emitting Seichel, or I'm throwing a stone, or I'm drawing, or the sun is giving off energy, or a radio, uh, or a transmitter is, giving, is, is, is generating uh, sound waves, or a uh, generator is electricity, everything is emitting. But when you break it down, there's different types of emission. So what he added now is that Shefa, we also use the word Ha'ara, reflection. What he means is, not a reflection like sunlight type of reflection. Here there is something of substance. It's only the outer dimension of it, but it's from Mechus HaPnimis. Like the inner intelligence that you have for yourself, the outer intelligence that is Shaykh, that is, uh, uh, is um, commensurate, but not Shaykh, is that it's... Um, it, it's a, 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 within the reach of and Shaykh um, Alamakabu means Shaykh just no, 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 we're not talking about Mashal Shaykh means that it is uh, re- relevant to that uh, the recipient Ukumoy Kain in the parentheses he adds Atzmis HaMeichin V'Hameichin HaShiyachim El HaMidish in his Baralel Perek Nun Hei and similarly is also the difference between the essence of the intelligence and the way intelligence has a relationship already with relationship is the word I wanted to use with emotions, as we discussed earlier, chapter fifty-five. I'm just remembering. It was in fifty-five. Do you remember 55 such an expression? Meichen Amidis? Yeah, okay. I don't remember Meichen Amidis. I remember Meichen. I remember in chapter 54, we said about the difference between how the universe is created from Mechen and from Midas, Chachum Bin Adas. He said chapter 55. Well, let me look into it. Okay. Bottom line, however, that there's a difference. Shazeh atzmi v'zeh atzmi. This is an this is a, a atzmi, this is not an atzmi. Let me describe atzmi here. Sometimes by chassidim you say this person is an atzmi. Some people say this person is a chitzen. Okay? That's two extremes. A chitzen means somebody that's just a. Uh, a chitzen means someone who's just. What's the word? Is, is uh, not just superficial, but he just he doesn't really have a premise. He's just showing, not showing off. He's just uh, superficial. Is very good. Word. Superficial. He's just on on the outside. He's like that. How would you translate a chitzen? A chitzen means he puts on a nice show, but there's nothing going on inside. A primi means someone that is a very internal person. But also internal, it's internal, meaning that what you see, you know, there's a deeper side, there's a real... Atzmi is even deeper, an atzmi, you say atzmi. The Rebbe Rashab, once the, the, the Bochum was singing a song, preparing, before he's going to say a mimer, and he saw them rushing the song, because they wanted to hear the mimer already. Mm-hmm. So he spoke a whole sikha, and instead of saying the mimer, he spoke a whole sikha about a, a difference in an atzmi, a primi, he called it. He says, a primi, where he is, he's completely there. So while you're singing, you should be singing. Even though the, you know the song is a preparation for the next step. But a primi, where he is, he's completely there. Beautiful. Yeah. The Rebbe, gave, the Rebbe told the story, it was um, 1970, right in the beginning, Yud Shvat. 20, the 20th anniversary of the Rebbe's leadership. Huh? Living in the present. When they finished, right, living in the present. But the Rebbe spoke like this. It was then they finished the Sefer Torah of Mashiach. Where were you guys in 1970? Did you hear news about it there? Ah, so they, it was Yud Shvat was a Friday, and the Mashiach Sefer that the, the, the of course I remember my, my bar mitzvah here. 
gangsters. I remember vividly. Everyone thought Mashiach's coming that Friday. So you got Mashiach? We got dressed up like the Shabbos and everything. More than today? Yeah. Today, for sure more than today. We did. The cynics made him get was Friday. And a lot of people came, relatively speaking. The first shul was still a small shul. I remember, of course I remember, 13, how, you know. Yud Shvat, and uh, the Rebbe said, we're going to finish the Sefer Torah, that the Friedrich Rebbe began writing that, and he said that we'll finish it to, and, and go with it to Mashiach. So everybody bought letters in it, and that was the whole thing. The Rebbe had a fabring in that Friday afternoon. Yud Shvat, it was like big. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people came. It was, uh, the Rebbe said that I'm a in Indian Ksiba Sefer Torah to understand the idea of a writing of a Sefer Torah. And Chav uh, Shvat, 10 days later, is when guests that came returned to Israel. The Rebbe had a Fabrain in that, I think it was, if Yud was Friday, 10 days later would be what? Yud Zion would be uh, a Shabbos, Sunday, uh, Monday, yeah. Monday afternoon there was another Fabrain, a special Fabrain. And um, in the middle of the and the Rebbe says, I could see people looking at the watch, at the clock, because they're rushing to go to the airport, they have to go back. So the Rebbe told the story, he says, the Friedrich Rebbe, he says, the Schwer was uh, once, he was in uh, Leningrad, preparing to go for a very, very secret and dangerous meeting in Moscow. And... It was just a few minutes, 15 minutes before they were planning to go to the train. The Rebbe says, I walked into my shver and I see him sitting. And he's busy learning or doing something as oblivious. Not aware of, not, you know, usually before a trip, and this, especially a dangerous trip, you think as if nothing. And the Rebbe said these words. I, felt, I said to myself, you know, self-control. But to such an extent, he wondered. So he asked the Friedrich Rebbe that. He asked, he, so he asked the Rebbe, Ad kach? So the Friedrich Rebbe answered, he said, that my father taught me the secret of Hatzloch in Zman, success in time. And so he asked, what means Hatzloch in Zman? It's not clear whether the Rebbe asked the Friedrich Rebbe or the Friedrich Rebbe asked the Rebbe Rashab. But anyway, the Rebbe Rashab explained, Hatzloch in Zman means that in the moment when you're doing something, there's nothing else but that. And he gave the example of the Rajba. The Rajba would have a very busy day. He saw people. He studied. He answered questions. He uh, you know, involved learned all kinds of things. And still he had time every day to take a walk. Because where he was, he was completely there. So the Rebbe said, Tzlochen Zman means where you are, you should be completely here. And not looking at the clock about the airport that you're planning to go to soon. But then the Rebbe said, obviously maybe you can't expect this from everybody. But nevertheless, according to Chassidus, the world is recreated anew every second. So there's no JFK, there's no airplane, so there's nothing. Problems. Everything's going to be recreated anew, anew until it's going to be there. But then the Rebbe said, but since people, some people anyway may not be there, that will, 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 will sum up, you know, will uh, speed up the fabling. So I'm just to give you an example for an atzmi, trying to explain an atzmi, you see, it's hard to explain these things because we are not atzmi fundamentally. We are live in a chachenizdik world. Like cynics like to say in Madison Avenue, it doesn't matter what happened. It matters what people think happened. That cynical statement tells you the secret of all of existence. It's an external existence. It's a lying. Alma de shikra. This world lies all the time. Even when it's not lying, it's lying. Because what you see is not what you get. You see a world. You don't see its source. You can deny its source. And, but it's constantly being renewed. Like the whole point is, why is this a false world? God put it here. Of course, B'resh is Baruch Lakim. It's a real existence. But it's not real if you think it's on its own. It's like giving uh, credence to the, 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 to the shell of, of a fruit, to, to a potato peel. People live on the potato peel, and they make their, build their entire lives and plans around on the peel level. Forgetting there's something under the peel. There's a fruit within the peel. So, an atzmi, so there's a chitzen, is just someone who's completely superficial. Then there are people, you know, we all have an inner and an outer. A child, for example, if you remember, he said before, he said uh, about a child, last end the last mime, it was unbelievable, I thought. This, this itself, I'm like blown away by. A cotton is an atzmi. 
Kola Atzmis is there. Because he doesn't have anything blocking it. So what you see is everything. He's complete Bittl. Bittl B'chol Atzmusay. As soon as we become intelligent, as soon as we become, even more than that, we become conscious of ourselves, you right away have two things. There's me and who I'm conscious of. Basically, a true experience, like before Eta Itzadas was, there was no difference between the subject and the object. Meaning, you are, if you are Das, Mola Ares, when it says the world will be filled with divine knowledge as the waters cover the sea, you are Das. It's like a fish in water. Does a fish get wet? Does water get wet? You are water. You're, you're, when you are the itness of it, you're not becoming it. So you're not like in a stage, okay, I'm, uh, here I am, now I'm going to study something, now I know. Here I am dry, now I touch water, I got wet. You, you become one with the knowledge, then you are, that's called really being, at, it, it, to, to, to be misatsim with the thing. So object and subject, the world of duality that we live in, object, subject, Gavre Hefza basically, person and, and object, and then there's also of course your relationship with object is like Poyal Pu'ula Pnifl, is already a world where, where, where there's the Atmi is in one place, the Chitzenis is another, the Primis is another. So basically what he's saying is that when it comes to Shefa, or Er for that matter as well, but Shefa, yes, of course, of course the Atmi, this is Atmi, this is not Atmi. But there is something of the etzem that is being conveyed. There's something being transmitted. It's interesting, earlier, if you remember, he said the rotsen, the etzem of the rotsen goes into the faculties. Whereas the faculties themselves, the etzem doesn't go, it's only a reflection of them. It's almost like reverse. Because rotsen there is the, is the transcendent, and the faculties are the imminent. There, however, he also said the rotsen is only a reflection of, but it doesn't go through gradations. So there, he was talking about Ha'ar in a different way. I mean, I'm just answering a question, because there you could say you could argue the exact opposite. There he says, the Ratzin, that's why the Ratzin had rules everywhere, because it's down. But there, that's a different word. There, it's like the Gili Mina Etzem rules, because it doesn't consider anything, so it just tells you the way it is. That's the Atzmi part of that. Here, on the other hand, there's something that actually of intelligence that goes into the one faculty gives to another. But if you talk about it from the perspective of gradations, it's much more reflections, as opposed to the Ratzin, which is more of an atzmizdik impact, which I don't want to go into now. That I'm sure we'll discuss this. In other words, we're talking here about different types of, of, of impact, different types of relationships. So there's no question the will of somebody, as he said, dominates. It can actually completely conceal... A person's faculties. You can reveal all the faculties. Whereas in faculties themselves, because premium, internal energy, doesn't work that way. Because it measures itself. You know, when a teacher is teaching a student, there's a, a proportion going on. There's a relationship between them. So a relationship goes back and forth. A commander or a king ordering doesn't have that. And as we said earlier, that doesn't take as much, but it's not as much internalized. So it goes both ways. Er atzmi, the Er Atzmi, transcendent energy, gives you a more powerful force, but it's not that much internalized. So you don't really get it. It's really from outside of you. Where here, you're, you're, it's, it's not as powerful, but what it, what it is, it does get internalized, and you're getting something of substance that's remaining with you. So when the king orders you, yes, there's an Atzmi going everywhere, because it's controlling everything. But, you're not, but there's nothing that the king is giving you of himself. He's just giving you his order. When you're getting intelligence, you're not getting maybe that same level of atmi that is in desire, in the, in the will, and desire, but what you're getting has substance. So this, it all comes down to what you're talking about. Is the, so here we're talking in Shefa, the emission has some substance. It's only chitzenius. Like he said, compared to the etzim, the, the inner understanding of the, of, the, of, the, of the mashpia, of the teacher. Or like he said, the, his atmi is the kemeichen. As opposed to the intelligence compared to relationship with emotions, this is atzmi v'zeh eina atzmi. And nevertheless, by shefa, the flow, the outer is from the inner. It's not like two separate worlds. You throw something, or you're conveying intelligence, em- em- emanating intelligence. It's coming from the power of throwing or the power of your intelligence. Yep. All this is in general about something that is only a reflection. He's just making a qualification. 
All this is at, at the end of the day of a reflection. Because something that is really an atzmi, even part of the essence is also the essence. So he's adding now another dimension here that we didn't even discuss. We discussed it a lot earlier. At the end of the day, Eir and Shefa are both an emission and in many ways are not the source. Now he's saying there's a thing called a real atzmi. When you really have a part of the etzem, not etzem asechel, or etzem akech. When you throw something, the throwing power, yes, is coming from the power within your arm, which is much more fundamental and much more powerful within. When you admit intelligence to somebody, you're also giving them something of substance, but it's much deeper inside. But the atzmi, real etzem, wherever it goes, whatever you touch, you, you get all of it. Which is why in a shama, for example, a chelik elikam mal mamish, but it's an atzmi. So you touch a piece, you touch the whole thing. That's a qualification that's not discussed relevant here. He's just saying it to qualify again language, what we mean by atzmi. So that, that's a real, that's a, that's a ma'atzmi mamish. There's a lot of language going on in this chapter here. That's a lot what's going on is er, shefa, ha'ora, atzmi, chtenis, primis. Va'im asher kosev ba'abir div yeshuvu. Be'inyin bitzalmenu kinusenu. And look at the explanation in the, in the, in the beer of Yeshuvu. It's a mimer. In the Indian, the concept, B'tzalmenu Kidmuseinu, about when the human being was created in the image, what do we say, the image and shape of the divine, Shazel al Darach Moshul Tzalem Adam She'esim Matchis Oyeitz. That this, for example, is like the image of a person that you shape, you create, Matchis, in a piece of. Matris, clay matris. Before we said metal, matris. What's matris? Matris is, clay uh, cheres is, no, matris, yeah, metal. Yeah. Oy etz, or in wood. You know, when you etch, you etch in, 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 you carve or etch an image of a person. And you also draw, not just the thing, you also draw the life force. In other words, you see it's a live person. Either you see it in the movie. The Adam. The Chitukhaivarim, the, the grave engraving, the the the, the carving. Chituk more than chitu. The shape. What's Chitukhaivarim? Chituk is the, the form of the organs who's come every every adam. They're exactly like the organs of the person. So you see an arm in the image, it's exactly like the arm. What about the life force? You see, let's say, a person throwing something in an image. So you can envision, but the the chayis, obviously, it's only it's only like a it's only a um, uh, it's only a shape, only a demus. So tzelem is seeing is is, is 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 they're both an image. That's clearly, but one is an image that gives you exactly the parameters, exactly the shape and form as it is in the original, and the other is only giving you a type of sense of it. So the mus is, mus is a sense, huh? Yeah, this, this, in this, this interpretation. There are other interpretations. It's only a sense. In other words, you, you sense the life force, but it's only a demus of it. The you and Shamba Nimshal. And look there, delve there into the Nimshal. Into how this, into the lesson that comes, that we learn from this. And look at what we learn, discuss later, chapter 369. Now he goes in the parentheses. According to this, we'll understand Mashat Silus who are One second. Mashat Silus who are And according to this, we'll understand that what Atzilus is only is a reflection of the Kav, of the line of energy that brings energy from before the Tzimtzum into existence. That this reflection of the Kav and Atzilus that this reflection of the Kavanat Silas is coming from the Muhus Atzmis, from the inner identity and essential personality of the Kav. Shalemayel Matzilas, that's higher than Atzilas. The actual B'chinus Chitzenis. Only thing is that it's in a form of outer. In other words, he's saying, this is like like the Shefa that he's describing. Nevertheless, it's only Mitzias, it's not Muhus. You know it exists, but you don't know what it's like. We said Muhus is Mahu, what it's like. Commission is Borlael Pedeklamat Ches, like we learned earlier, chapter 38. I'm just looking there quickly. Okay, yeah. 
Yeah, very ches. The liyese b'chinas ha'ara chitzenis. Being that it's only our outer reflection. We call canal, like we said earlier. Because of our pardis, and the pardis writes from the Ramak, the lamata yediyah samitzis, ena afil ziv ma'atzmus. That below, knowing that something exists, right, is not even a reflection of the essence. So lamayla, and above, Meaning down here below, how we know that God exists, that the divine exists, is not even a reflection of the Atmos. But above, meaning in the higher worlds, um, the Metzius is actually knowing, is, is actually the reflection of the essence. Meaning that there is not just a reflection of a reflection, so to speak, but there's an essential understanding of it. And maybe we can say that the containers of Ak are the dimension of air, of energy, of air. This is very dense, and and basically, it's just applying what we're learning to this particular level. But wait, let me just sum it up. What we've discussed here so far is the following. He's speaking how Shefa works, which means how internal energy works, Pnimi. So the key thing is that it works, that there's something of substance, something that is substantial that's being conveyed. Not just a reflection like with the sun or the or life force, where there's nothing being nothing really being transmitted of substance, because it doesn't have to have an impact. Here, there's an impact. Shefa is an impact. So you're conveying, let's say, intelligence. However, it's an outer dimension of it. To explain outer and inner, or this, that this is atzmi, this is not atzmi, he says that it's similar to the tzelem admus. Think of it like. You have the essence of something, you have a human being. That's the thing itself. We don't see the human being. We see now an image of the human being engraved in metal or in stone. Or, in, I'm sorry, metal or in, uh, in wood. There's two things here. You have the engraving of the, the organs. Okay, so you can now see, actually see something about this thing. That is like more, um, would be, that would be more what he calls a... Um, that's Selim, yeah, that's Selim. What he's referring to it here, I'm just looking for what words it would be called. This is, this is the Ha'ara Chitsenius, I believe. The outer. The, 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 then the life force that you're getting, that's, maybe that's the outer. I'm not sure which is the outer. He's not spelling it out. Okay, one second. Okay, not clear, positive, which way it goes here. Which is which? It seems that the Dmus is probably the example he wants to explain, that you highest, you only get a sense of the, the, the energy. Right, that's the Chitzenius. Yeah, that's what it looks like. The Tselem is, in other words, not really relevant here. Well, let's put it this way. What level is that? That would be the level. Maybe that's what he's saying about Ak. In the parentheses, that's already above that you get some type of mohusa gili. This is more mitzias. And so the kalim of ak, maybe that's what he's saying. The containers of ak are more like the tzelim. You're getting you get you're getting a, a clear picture of the actual organs, but the life force, the the dmus is all. But you're only getting an image of the of the thing of this. Okay. One second, one second, one second. Okay, we have to look there because it says you and Shamba Nimshal. Fine. Now going out of the parentheses, and that's why the impact and the effect of Shefa of the flow, which this comes through a transmission and through an extension and expansion, is in a state of 
manifestation and confinement and as I said commitment uh, apl- application. And they cause a change and and a uh, and a, and a spilus, and even an excitement, an effect on the one that is the producer here, Produce? the one that's producing this uh, this impact. In this case, the transmitter, basically, or the emitter. Yeah, there's the whole, the whole chapter is the whole thing. The teacher is affected by his teaching. Yeah. Spilus. Spilus means excitement, literally, but a spilus means she knew change in spilus, and there's a uh, emotional impact on him. There's an impact on him. Um, why? Because as he said, let's go back. Because even though it's only external, but it's coming from the thing itself. It's coming from within itself. That's what he's saying. Even if it's only external. Fine. <sighs> now, on the other hand, by contrast, there's no substance. There's no identifiable entity here. And the transmission and emanation is all in the form of air. Er, it's all in the state of air, er, not in the state of Shefa. State of air, er, so it remains aloof, remains apart, it remains beyond, detached. And look what we'll say later in chapter 59. And that's why its impact, its effect, is not in the form of manifestation and confinement or commitment or application. And it doesn't cause any change, any spilus, therefore, in effect and impact on the source. Now this is this is harizel. Now this is like it's known by the two types of ayin. Ayin shall yeshamit, ayin shall yeshanivra. Let's explain what that means. In Kabbalah Siddhas, they talk about yesh, yesh, two states of itness. Yesh Amiti, let's say, is the divine essence, and yesh anivra is the, divine, the, the, the itness of existence. They're both an it. Obviously, there's the ultimate it, and this is the created it. Between any two states of yesh, there needs to be an ayin be'emtza. Because how did it go from here to here? So a seed needs to go through rot, deteriorate, in order to grow into a plant. Um, everything. For, creativity is a child of frustration. You have to melt a piece of gold to shape it into a beautiful ornament. You have to shed a layer of skin to go to another layer of skin. There's always an eye. There's a vacuum, a void between two states. A metamorphosis requires a vacuum. An ayin be'emtza. The expression is ayin ben. Yes, yes. Ayin be'emtza. I didn't say ma. Where did I say ma? Anyway. Ayin be'emtza. The expression is ayin be'emtza. That's not, no, that's not. You're misunderstanding. Dover ma means there's no substance there. But that, that's not That's not the word ma. That's not what it means here. Anyway. So what you have here is an ayin in between. Now, when you break it down, because this breaks it down, that really the ayin breaks into two parts. There's the ayin that from the yesh, the first yesh, meaning from the source, that it goes into, a, in the metaphor for this part, it, like, so to speak, has an ayin that represents it. And then there's an ayin preceding the, the new creation. So there's really, the ayin has two parts. The one that relates to the source and the one that relates to the product. We call it the producer and the production. The producer and the production is an ayin. The, between the ayin has two parts. So that's what he's saying now. Ayin and, interface, uh, an interface of ayin. Exactly right. Exactly right. So he's saying this, this that he's discussing here between Aaron and Shefa is, uh, is similar to what is al similar to what is discussed about the two levels of ayin. Ayin shal yesh amiti. There's the ayin. The void, you can say, the, the nothingness, the vacuum of the yesh, of the it, the real it, the true it. The ayin shal yesh and there's the nothingness from the perspective of the created it. 
let me just explain what sometimes how the, what are these two ions. So when we, for example, from the Yeshanivra perspective, we say, where did we come from? And we wonder. Something beyond us. As far as you go, all it is, it's ayin. It's, I don't know what it is. So I say it's ayin. It's like beyond transcendence, beyond my experience. That's not the ayin amiti. That's not the ayin of the yesh amiti. It's the ayin of the yesh amiti. The yesh, realizing there's an ayin beyond it. The ayin of the yesh amiti is the other way around. The God says, I want to create a world. And um, in order to do so, I'm creating a state that is somewhat like foreign to me. Because the ayin, the yesh amiti, doesn't need an ayin. So it's right away, you know, it's not called simpsom. You'll see here, it's, it's, it's another perspective that is how the divine sees existence, basically. So there's also, it's a form of, like it says sometimes, yesh ma'ayin, for us, ayin is elikus, and for God, we're the ayin. Because that's the real yesh. So the question is, which one is the mystery? Which one is the, we call the anomaly? From our perspective, God is anomaly. This is existence. Elim is this This is apparent existence. This is given to us. And God is the, is the mystery. Is the, and from God's perspective, God is the reality, and we're the mystery. We're the aberration, so to speak. We're the anomaly. We're the novelty. So novelty, novel, it's ayin, novel. It's like the story with the chassid and the not chassid where they argue about God and this one, this one says yes, then the back and forth and then finally the chassid says to him, you know, I envy you, you think about God all the time. I have to be honest, I think about myself all the time. So the non chassid was very impressed, you know, the compliment. But later he came to realize as he got older or someone made him aware, it was really an insult. You think about God because you know you exist. You don't have to think about yourself. That's a given. Your only question is, does God exist? So you, comp- you, you ponder about God. I know that God exists. That's a given. I don't have to think about that. I think about myself all the time. Do I exist? How do I exist? Maybe I don't exist. Why do I exist? Those are the two ions right there. How would God destroy the world? So the yes says, he'd bring a flood, he'd bring fire, he would spread out all the ashes. The, the Ayin Amiti would say, God wants to destroy, just, just stops speaking, just stops willing, and stops being. So, here he goes. So, Zewa Ayin the Das Alyan, the Ayin the Das Tachten. These two levels of Ayin, from the Yesh Amiti, one is the Ayin of Das Alyan, the perspective from above, how the, the perspective above sees, sees reality. The Ayin the Das Tachten, the Ayin, how the perspective below sees Ayin. The Ayin the Das Tachten, Ayin of Bechinus Ayin Mamish. From the perspective of below, to say it's, it's not really I and Mamish. It's just relative to me. It's something beyond me. You can't say that nothing at all exists from the perspective of the Yesh below. Obviously, you, you, we are part of existence. Like he spoke earlier about Bittl, that the Bittl at the end of the day is a Bittl of Mitsuyuse in his existence. Because this Ayan is a source for this Yesh. That's where it comes from. And you cannot say that it's utterly nothingness. It, there's a relationship. There's a proportional relationship. This ayin has given life to us. It's a mystery to us, so we call it ayin. What is it? But you can't call it complete nothingness. And it's only called ayin, meaning a borrowed name. When we say a borrowed name, Shem HaMushal is almost like a, what's the word in English, Shem HaMushal, a borrowed name. Not a nickname, that's a Shema Kinui. Shema Mushal means borrowed. Using a name to extract something else, but it's not really that thing. For I in the Das Elyon, however, the Ayin of Das Elyon, who begins Ayin Mamish, is actual Ayin. Shua Adav, who Kalo Mamish, because it's a reflection and it's completely nullified in the presence of the essence of the source. So that Ayin senses real nothingness. Real no substance, basically. And he's explained these are going to be the two examples of Eren Shefa and Er Pnimi and Er Makif. So in other words, what this chapter is doing is, is going into a deeper understanding, of, especially when you, once you interpret the words, we're not talking here about, you know, he's not discussing the purely the words, does it have a function or doesn't have a function. We're talking about the example comes to tell us 
what is being happening here? Is there something of substance? That's the most important thing. So in other words, if you really think about it, if something is really an ayin of the yeshamiti, does it have a function? Yes, it may have a function. It has a purpose, you know, like the, the but it, but it's so sublimated by the essence that that's all that matters. So there's nothing of substance there. That's the the focus here. So now he's going to explain. Well, that is the beginning of the very makiv, and the same similarly is the difference between state of the, in, the imminent energy and the transcendent energy. The air primi who lifel, air primi is to lifel. The imminent energy is to have an impact. So it is fundamentally something of substance, of identity, as I've been defining it. And the transcendent energy is only a revelation of the essence, revealing, expressing the essence. It's in a state of ayin batsam. This ayin. That nothing really, nothing exists, only the source. And this is in their essential existence as they emerge from Atmos. As he said earlier, the Tchilas Mamshachosim, all the way from the root. Now, now he's going to come to the answer. What's that sound? However, as they the spashas, as they extend, as they spashas, as they spread out, outside of the source. Also the also the transcendent energy affects something, has an impact. Okay, let me before we continue here. First of all, what time is it? Okay. So he asked the question at the beginning of the chapter, don't we see from the examples that they also have a function? So how could you say they're just there to reveal the essence and they don't have a function? And also makif. Makif has an effect in the world. So just to say that it's just revealing the essence. So to, to explain it, he went to a long discussion here that we really need to look deeper into what we're learning from these examples. What we mostly were learning from these examples is, this, is the state of being of what they're like. One is an identifiable state of being, and one is not. That's the key. One, and that's what means one has a function. The function is because it has to impact something, it has to have some identity of what it's going to do. Ten spheres or whatever it may be. The other one is just revealing, and therefore it is, it, it is essentially ayin. It has, doesn't have any type of identify, an identity. still doesn't answer the question completely. And but that's what they are both their roles as they leave as they emerge from Atmos. And he went through this whole levels that how this works. He speaks about Shefa, that Shefa is something of substance, even though it's external. I'm just summing up the whole thing. Okay. And Ur, there's nothing of substance, no identity at all. In the transmission, in the emission. That's all in the root. So now we understand from Ur and Shefa what it means in the root. But now, Er Makiv Er Primi are beginning to travel, so to speak. They travel before the Tzimtzum and after the Tzimtzum. And there are two realities, there are two forces in existence. She so says, when, once they become two forces in existence, even Er Makiv now assumes, an, it assumes, it's a, it assumes a function. But it still retains its essential personality. That's what he's going to say now. So, this, so what he's explained here is that Aaron Shefa explains really the difference between Mary Makim and Primi, both in their source and outer. In their source, the main focus is on what kind of, is there substance here or no substance? Is there identity or there's no identity? Is it a complete ayin, meaning like the ayin of the Yesh Amiti, nothingness altogether because all that matters is the source? Or is the ayin Yesh Anivra, that there's a sense of something beyond, but it's still commensurate and something. It's still, you can't call it complete ayin. It's only relative, uh, substanceless. So now he's saying, now as they extend outward, meaning their impact here, so also makif has an impact. However, raksha pu'ulu da'er makif, eina deimekla la pu'ulu da'er pnimi. However, the impact, the effect, the function of er makif is not similar at all. Can be compared to the, the function of er pnimi. She'ena b'chinnis t'visiv islapshus. 
Because as we said, even if, starting from their source, one is manifest, in, invested, involved in a particular function, and therefore has substance, and therefore is involved in that. One is about internalizing. It's the teacher that's applying himself. The other one is just revealing the source. So yes, at some point, Markov will have an impact, but its impact is going to be completely different than the impact of Erpnimi. Because all the way from the source, they're different. That, okay. For Inyan, who was the Inyan in this is, the Hine called over yes. I'm sorry. And the Indian, this is the the the, the that, that that now in everything there's the yes atzmus pastors In everything there's an atzmus vispastus. Remember, I explained before etzem and vispastus and atzmi. Etzem is how you are within yourself completely. Vispastus is how you express yourself, how you spread out. The gamba eid ein sof ein sof. Also in the infinite light, the divine light yes between the atzmus the ein sof. There's the essence of the divine light and there's its expression, its extension, its expansion. Everything has these two, except obviously Atmos himself. The essence of the energy is only the revelation of the essence. It's only to reveal, to express the essence. And the expression, the expansion of the energy, that's coming to impact something. This is what we discussed earlier in chapter 56, which is the previous chapter. Then, and the, and the infinite divine light, fundamentally, you can't give it any name. And if you give it a name, it's the name desire. Now he's explained the deeper meaning of that. The intention in that is, the meaning in that is. At the end of the of the last mimer. You could only call it Ain Shaif, he said. But when you give it a name, it's called like he says when it comes, it's called Ratsan. So he says, What's the Kavana? The Pchinisa The essence of the divine light you can't call any name at all. Or Pchinisa Spastus, Lefisha Balifal Shaykh Sham Shem. But it's extension, because it's coming to impact something. There you can describe it. As I said, definition. But only the name desire. Because desire has some connection to the thing you want, the object that you want. But it's not any type of a, 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 a substance of its own. Like we said earlier, desire, the whole example of desire, this explains why I use that example, is nothing but the desire of the soul. It has, yes, it wants something. So you, that's why you can give it a name. The name name, the name is desire. I, I desire. Because desire has a relationship with something. The essence of the divine light, you can't even say, I desire something. Because you need to give, that's, that's already a definition. Here, desire has some type of uh, the desire, the word rotsen already has some type of definition, but it's the closest thing to no definition. Because it's only about desire. It doesn't say what you want. If you said seichel, that's already a real definition. And that's why its function is not in a form of manifesting, a form of commitment. As we discussed earlier, chapter 52. The whole discussion on, on rotsen. Rotson does not manifest in the thing that it desires. It 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 tells it orders and then the rest begins it automatically happens. We could say that nefesh in the soul The essence of the desire is also to be content. That's not that also is not the function. It's not it's not that does not a function. And it doesn't have a relationship with anything. It's only a reason for there to be a desire for it. The commission is about El as we discussed earlier in that chapter 52. Then he said the word Tainuk, but before Tainuk he said the fact that, remember he said desire does not get anything in return from the faculties that it, 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 it impacts. As opposed to, let's say, a teacher 
that get something in return. Does, so he asked the question in the parentheses there, what do you mean, doesn't he get content when he understands something? Or when he does somebody a favor, he's content. So he said two things. He said, number one is, the contentment is not that you have more desire or the desire is has taken on a shape. It's, just, it's, it's almost like an incidental effect of the whole process that you have contentment from it. So it doesn't change anything, if it's really. Or, or right, it's successful, so you have contentment from it. But it's not like it shapes the desire. It's not like you have more seichel, a teacher from students, they sharpen his mind. This is just almost like a, a, an incidental. The sun doesn't have any contentment from the sun shining on earth. Correct. Here there is a contentment, but its contentment is not in a way that's impacting the desire. It's only a, a type of result of. See, but it's a cause for. That's how we can. And then he said, and primarily is that it impacts the pleasure. And the pleasure is communicating that contentment to desire, not the faculties are. Those are the two things he said. Here he's not mentioning pleasure. So he's just, he's just really saying that even desire, he's just explaining now, he explained to, what, is, what did he explain in this last section? He explained, to, he's trying to explain here how uh, there's like almost two stages even in the Ur Makif. There's the transcendent energy as it's in its source. There, no function. All it is revelation of its source. As it travels, as it begins to imp- uh, get inv- as it becomes part of, emerges and becomes part of reality after the symptom in existence, its function is similar. It now has a function. And so he's explaining that's the difference between etzem and ispashtus in the source. The etzem, all is etzem, you can't even call it a name. There's no identity. Now you can call it an identity, now it's called desire. Remember the example for transcendent energy is desire. So that already is a name. A name, but it's not a name that you could say desire for what? We don't know for what. All it is is a desire, but it's, desire is already something outside of the pure essence where there's no desire at all. In the first chapter in, in, in Ayin Beis, he made a whole case that, that without Keser, without Ratzin, you have no connection to it. There's no relationship with anything. If I don't want something, I have no connection with it. There's no will, there's no relationship. So even will is already a step away. But it's not a step like the faculties where ten spheres. So Ratzin is a level before the ten spheres. Keser, higher than the ten spheres, in the source. So that's what he's explaining. The Etzema air has no spheres, so to speak. It just doesn't even have a name. You say, whether Anoichi, or even higher than that. I think it's also out of it already. Uh, it depends. It depends. it depends on what level. Ratzin. At the beginning of Ratzin, tiny Ratzin. Then there's how it at least has a name. But this name is not a Metziah's Dover. In the parentheses, he's adding that, well, you could say if that's the case, there is something nitfus, because now I want something, I desire something. But remember, he made a whole case that desire is not nitfus. It's not, it's not confined by. So he's adding now, in the nefesh, meaning not just above, also by us, when you say the etzim you're, you're content, it's not for a function. It's also not relationship with things. It's just a cause for... So the contentment... Why you desire, in other words, because you become content from this thing. That contentment is not the same type of relationship with the object, let's say, when you invest intelligence in it or emotions and so on. That's what he's adding here. He's just trying to explain that even Ratzin is not nitfus. That's the point. Now, it's definitely the higher level. The same thing is the level of energy and light. Fundamentally, it's complete ayin, substanceless and pshittis, shapeless, formless, completely. There's no relationship with anything. All it is, is a reflection of the source. And it's an, ext- and it's an extension. When it spreads out, when it extends, obviously, before the symptom, there's no spreading, it's all relative, but it's two types of states. And it's spread out, it already has a relationship and it affects something. But it still retains that element of it that it's not in the form of being confined by and buying and being uh, manifesting in. So for example, where you see now the sun shines or the soul gives energy, yes, they have a function. But the way they function is not through islapshas. So that's what he's adding here. So just to say that it doesn't have a function... This chapter qualified that. It depends what you mean by function. In, in, in its source, it has no function at all. In its expansion, 
It has a function, but it's a function that is still not manifest in the in the in the object that it's that it's uh, impacting. Um, one second, it's not a function that way that's not impacting. One is of substance, one is not of substance. Okay. Look, this chapter needs explanation, plenty of it. What in Havana, in understanding, it's not. It's it's actually very clear what he's stating, but you have to the Havana, the understanding of it. But let me let me finish reading, and then I'll explain today and the next class and so on. which means lefisha beetzem uhusay hurak bechinus gilei meetzem minetzem, because it's the reason the fees because the fundamental essence of it, it's only a revelation and an expression of the essence. And it's in the state of ayin. Being that it's, I mean, I sorry, I should have read, because it is fundamentally in its root, only revelation of the essence, and a state of nothingness, also in its extension, it's also in a form of nothingness. And even though the makif, as we said, the transcendent energy has an impact, and impacts the world, has a b'chinus makif. It's in a form of Beyond, it's not manifest and contained. And it's everywhere equal. As it's known that the the infinite light, the transcendent light, even though it affects the world, as we shall discuss, that the transcendent energy makes has many impacts on the world. And he'll discuss the details later. It's not through manifesting in them. And this is what it says, as we learned earlier, that the heavens and the heaven and the heavens cannot contain you. Because they're not a container to the transcendent energy to receive them internally. Remember, we said, only COVID is glory, which that manifests in different stages, that manifests in the world. And there's stages in heaven and earth differently. But it says, that I fill all of the world. Ani, my essence, the essence of the light, the transcendent, is in the same category. The heaven and heavens cannot contain you. Because we're talking about the transcendent energy. So the infinite, the imminent energy cannot, I'm sorry, they cannot be contained in a form of imminence. Ki'im, ma'shemeir e'leim b'chinz makif levad. Rather, only that they radiate in the form of makif. He's going back now to chapter um, 49, which this was discussed. He's, he's connecting it all. Makiv Levat. Or Makiv Lekulim B'Shava. And it surrounds them and it transcends them, all, all of them equally. Lekulim, to all of them equally. Makiv She'enim B'chin is Kele Le'ezeh. Because they're not a container to this energy. As we spoke, in, in Primi, everything is a container to an energy. She'gam HaMadregas HaYesu El Yena B'Shava Elamis. Because even the highest level in the world is Kome B'chin is Parsev Da'ak. Like the configuration of Adam Kadmon, the primordial man, the highest level in existence. That's the level of Shemeya Shemayim. We said heavens and the heavens of heavens. What's the heaven of heavens? That's Ak. There's Tehiri Elah. These are new terms he hasn't used before, I believe. Tehiri Elah means the higher... Uh, Tehiri literally means Eir, can be Eir. But Tehiri Law is a level in Kabbalah and Chassidus that talks about Tehiri Law is usually the energy before Atzilus. There's different opinions. Sometimes Tehiri Law is used afterwards. There's footnotes on this elsewhere. We won't discuss that right now. But for now, Tehiri Tata Shachat Simpson. This is so-called the lower luminary. Tehiri can be luminary. The lower is luminary. That's after the Simpson. Even the high, even that highest level, Gamkein and Kehilu Le'erze, is also not a container for this transcendent energy. Li'ez Bebe Pchines Primi. That it should be able to permeate it, and penetrate it, internalized. Only in a transcendent from distance, a detached way. And therefore, and the same reason, naturally, and therefore, Similarly, who save It also surrounds even the highest levels. It's an equalizer. Like it says, below the the arms. Not the arms. What's the 
zereya, no, the arms, shoulders. You say shoulders, zereya, zereya is um, yeah, the shoulders, the arms of the le- of the world. So metachet zereya seilam, below shoulders of the is the world. So even the lowest levels is also v'hu b'chinas seivu v'akholi. This is referring to the general seivu. Not that, remember, every world has a kasset. Every world has its desire. Every world has its so-called transcendent energy. Here we're talking about the transcendent of the transcendent. Shaseva makiv klolos eishtalsus, the kavachut kulim bashva, that surrounds and encompasses klolos eishtalsus, the overall cosmic order that was that is shaped by the kavachut, by the ray and the thread of light. So kulim bashva surrounds them all equally. Is the all the big equalizer, like the eagle hagodel, the big surround. But this is what I Or it could be the eagle agadol from before the tzimtzum. It doesn't say. It doesn't spell it out. No, even the highest worlds are don't contain this. But what is it? This can be zmakavah kaseva kloli. Is usually the eagle agadol. It's usually the light that remains after the the light right before the tzimtzum that becomes so called the big circle. It's called. Okay, this is a heavy chapter in Havana, but uh, let me read the kitzur. We'll explain it tomorrow because it's already getting late. Well, the cheder and the kitzur, the cheder, Eir Hashem, Eir Achayis, Nefesh Hashem, Gam Kin Lefel. The cheder, seemingly, the light of the sun and the light and energy of the spirit, the soul, also has is also to impact, also to have a, also has some little function to pull them. Achamuv and Mamisholim and all. However, what's understood from the examples which are Eir Pel Al Lebchinis Eslapsus. That the energy light does not impact in a form of manifestation. That's because it's not an identifiable entity. The shefa is the, the transmission, the emission of the flow is identifiable matter. And something, something essential, something of the essential identity of the reflection. Is being transmitted to affect something, lifama, to cause, to have some impact. Therefore, it comes in a form of manifestation and containment. Containment is the right word. And above, this is the imminent energy because its purpose is to affect. Therefore, it emanates. It, it, it emerged in a form of mitziyaseir that you have an identifiable energy. And the reflection of the Kav of the Natsilis is from the essence of the energy that's higher than Natsilis. That's like Shefa, what he's saying right now. The Moose. Okay. Volcano poil begins to slap through the feet, and that's why it affects in the form of manifestation and containment. Avol erin yoni u begins gilia etzem. Energy, on the other hand, as opposed to shefa, its inyan, its role, its personality, is revel- revealing the essence, expressing the essence. V'yesh be etzem be ispashtus, and it has within it two stages. One is its essential energy, and the ispashtus, its extension. Its extension is to impact. But the way it impacts is not in a manifested form. In a form of makif. That's why it surrounds everything. It encompasses everything equally. So basically, it's demonstrated here that Oyer really has two stages in it. And this is all not Shefa. One is as it is in its own right, meaning as it emerges from the essence, and there only is the recognition of its revealing the essence, and then it's how it begins to manifest, and ex- not manifest, is not the right word, how it begins to spread, how it begins to go beyond that state, and that's how it plays a role in existence, And but that role is a, still a transcendent role. Bottom line, in, in if you want to put it in spiritual and personal terms, what he wants to establish in the interface is this, that you can have transcendence within existence. That's from the Shefa, though. No, Shefa is not transcendence. Tra- Shefa is imminence. Shefa is, is a relationship. 
Yeah. So, uh, now, so what he's established here in that interface is that it's not that transcendent. You could say, you could argue, you know what, in existence all you have is imminence. You have a relationship with a diminished state of divine. But if you want the, the, the undiminished state, the undiluted form, unfettered, you have to completely go out of existence. He's saying here that, no, in within existence we also have transcendence. That transcendence is rooted in a transcendence that is beyond everything. So it has a function that later we're going to discuss the details of this transcendent function. But what he's established is that there's a two levels in that itself. Okay, we'll stop here. That's uh, Discourse 14. Or the fourth, it's 15, I'm sorry. We just studied chapters, uh, chapter 57, page 104 through 106. Okay.